Hello everyone and welcome to UELFG where we find a party to share what they've learned from game making. I am your host Tina and today with me I have the developers of Parish here. Um, before we boot up the game, how about you tell us a little bit about yourselves and about the game? Um, we'll start with we'll start with you Brett. Kick us off. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, so uh, yeah, hey everyone. Um so I'm Brett. Um uh, we're both brothers. Uh, we, from about 2014, we um, we wanted to make video games together. Um, we just wanted to sort of recreate what made video games uh, good for ourselves when we were kids. So uh, yeah, we we decided to make um, co-op games, and it's it's been such a long journey since then. But um, yeah, so I did the art and the story for the game, and that's um, that's sort of my role. How about you, Regan? Hi, hi I'm Regan Ware. Same surname as you can tell. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so Brett, while Brett does the art, I do basically everything technical. I'm the programmer, setting up the game, multiplayer, networking, anything you can think of. Animations as well, with some mocap cleanup thrown in. So yeah, spinning plates. Yeah, so we're masters of none, but we are <laughs> we're jack of all. Which is really <laughs> incredible. Um, I do want to make sure that we we iterate to chat that the game we're going to be playing today was built by just you two. You didn't have anyone else on the team. It was a two two person studio who built this whole thing, right? Yeah. So for basically, the vast majority of the game is made by myself and Regan, and then um, we had a little bit of help from uh, our friend default interactive who helped us with the codec system and then it's probably worth saying as well like a game this big it just needs qa right so there's no way you can make a game like this that, and it does eventually need qa so um our publisher has this amazing team that helped us break the hell out of this game because multiplayer games they need a lot of breaking and a lot of fixing so so yeah much, i guess so much a core, fixing. a core team of two pretty much um so like all the art you see is just me and a little bit um, from default interactive and then um, most of the programming's Regan um, and it really wouldn't be possible without Unreal Engine and Blueprints even though we moved into C++ later we kind of had to for various reasons but maybe Regan will talk about that uh, later as well um, and, th and that's quite an interesting sort of journey as well that, because when we first started the game we wanted to see you know, the game was vastly different in scope. So we thought, let's try and make a blueprint only sort of multiplayer arena shooter. And then, of course, we couldn't keep it 
to that <laughs> and it sort of blossomed <laughs> over the years into something else very very cool well i am personally very excited for today's episode i will also be playing with you guys so it's not just gonna be um all of us just watching one person play all three of us will actually be in the game to show off the multiplayer aspect of it and y'all get to watch me totally fail at video games so it's gonna be great <laughs> <laughs> but before we dive in how about we uh we take a look at the trailer that you brought for us sounds great You are not supposed to be here. We have been led astray from our path. Fall back into the coffin out of which you unceremoniously scuttled. Through the portal, purgatory awaits. When you fail, return to me. This necromantic temple is used to long against the dead. Burn the profane and on the ground. Oh, so cool. Ah, I'm so excited to get into this. Um, but yeah, is there anything about that trailer, anything that you'd like to say before we go in, or do you just want to start? I'll leave it up to y'all. We should probably give some credit uh, for the music to uh, Brett's bandmate, Joe, from uh, the band Zilf, which is a huge right, part we're, of the we're game. Both in a, yeah, so Joe made the vast majority of the music for the game as well. Um, uh, every level has at least one song, if not three. So that's a really fun part of, and I think maybe an integral part of the game as well. So yeah, yeah, awesome. sort of ended up maybe with a game just... attached attached to an album. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very cool. That's the best setup I feel. Mm. Awesome. Well, if y'all are up for it, let's. Uh, I'm ready to to get into this. Yeah, let's jump in. Absolutely. Let's let's roll. Awesome. So my first question before we get into the, the action of it all is I was wondering if you could walk us around this starter lobby here and maybe uh, tell us a little bit about inspiration that you took for the creation of this game, where that may have come from, and just the, the general starting concept. Yeah, so um, this area is called Pantheon. It's kind of um, the hub world of the game, and it's, it's one of the oldest levels as well. Um, and the idea of the game is... Um, Again, we were kind of channeling games from from our childhood, I guess games from the past now, really. Um, thinking of some Xbox 360 games like um, Mech Assault Lone Wolf, where you all kind of start in a hub world, and you're all together, and you all kind of pick your gear, and then you all go off to fight. Uh, we really wanted to just bring that co-op feeling back. So, so this is what this is. This is where you start. This is the crumbling um, temple. Um, and we all kind of spawn in a, in a sarcophagus or, or, or a coffin, out of um, these sort of big chambers here. And um, Perish is a bit of a roguelike in the sense that it has a story campaign that you play through either alone or with friends. But the sort of general idea is if you die, you know, it's a, it's a journey to Elysium. The whole point is to um, basically find perfect oblivion rather than living this sort of half-life existence of sort of stuck in purgatory. So if you fail the journey anywhere along the point, you, could, you always come back here. Um, but to keep things fresh, every level changes objectives. Uh, but this level always stays the same. This is like your your safe spot. This is where you 
always come back to. Um, yeah, so I don't know if you've got anything else you want to say technical about this level, Regan, anything interesting about how it works? Or... Yeah, I think it's, this is sort of a, from a technical point of view where, where we reset the whole game. So, so the game's sort of dynamically loading levels as you, you'll sort of see as we go through. And uh, we have, it's a nice reset point for the game when everyone dies, which we know is going to happen at some point. So we know we're, we know we can come back here safely, reset everything, clean up, get everyone back together. It's a, I think it's important to have like sync, syncing moments in multiplayer games like this. And then obviously from a game point of view, it's also where you sort of bank the money you've collected in your in your run, and uh, see here purchase one of the many weapons. I've got them all unlocked. But we're not going to look at all of them today. We'll get, we'll get some some key ones in for sure. Yeah, so yeah Paris is very explorey sort weapons, of game. It requires that you sort of um, go into the world and find weapons before you can buy them. So, so that's fun. Some... Shall we? Uh, we jump in the portal and get a run started. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's do it. Um, yeah, let's do it. Talking briefly about inspiration as well. I just always loved the old um, Lord of the Rings game. So the Two Towers one. Um, Absolutely loved that one, and it had some amazing set pieces in it. So we tried to channel a little bit of that, sort of mixed in with a bit of um, Gustave Doré, um, a little bit of uh, Charles Louis Clarisseau as well, with this tile set in this in this particular circular room, which is the Orphic Temple. I think we'll see once we uh, once we get fighting. But I'm a I'm a massive fan and have way more hours than is reasonable in uh, The Dark Messiah as well. So once I start kicking, <laughs> yeah, we'll see where that comes from. I think that's I think that's like an eight hour game and I've got like a hundred hours in it. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Most of that's spent <laughs> just kicking enemies into stuff. Exactly, yeah. So this is our first objective and Parrish sort of cycles through objectives depending on um, sort of what objectives you've done before. So even though you go through the same levels, you, you have to do different tasks, basically. And sometimes you'll go to different areas as well. Uh, we, we've played a little bit just beforehand as well, so so that we, uh, we have slightly better weapons. Uh, because you, if you start the game from scratch, you start with a broken sword, and it is, it is tough. Uh, but we kind of wanted to give you this sense of... Um, growing in power, so you, you sort of, you find um, this currency in the world called, we call it Danaki, but uh, plural is Danakes. Um, so you, you find this currency in the world and then you bring it back to the hub world. So that's why the hub world is a really important place, um, because it's where you, it's not just where you sort of resync and reset, but it's where you get all your gear and it's, it's important to go back because the game quickly gets overwhelming if you uh, try and sort of go forwards without finding any new gear or buying it at Pantheon. Exactly, yeah. And for every objective you complete, you're given a choice of uh, three randomly picked cards. You can choose one of which. So uh, I think I've got an obvious choice here. I could uh, I could go Gambler to get some more money, but I think Explosive Daggers is always a good option because uh, Daggers can be really powerful if you sort of build into them throughout your run. Yeah, we've, and those we've got a lot only of different to your run, so. Yeah, yeah, we've got a, a lot of different mechanics going on in Parish, um, because we kind of developed it naturally. We kind of we added stuff as we saw fit. Um, so as we were making the game, we thought, um, let's add some cards in to the mix every time you complete an objective, um, because I mean everyone's played the super slick, super polished Hades and. I adore that game, and um, yeah, the cards are just such a good idea. Um, but uh, as a result, you know, um, Perish takes a little while to get used to, you know, all these different mechanics. Because um, when you start off, you also get these things called daggers. So you can, you know, it doesn't matter what weapon you have, whether you've got a melee weapon or um, or a, you know, like a big sort of gun, a machine gun, or a, a rifle. Uh, you can always use these daggers to sort of work your way out of sticky situations. We also have um, consumable items as well, so it's a funny, it's a funny kind of mix of yes, it's um, FPS, but like slight elements of getting some RPG stuff in there with sort of making your own builds. So we've seen some really funny stuff where people have 
tried to do dagger only runs. Um, I'm still waiting for someone to do a kick only run, but maybe that's Regan's time to shine. It's definitely possible. <laughs> yeah, we're, right right now we're in a uh, what, what's the law name for this again, Brett? Brett's the law man. Um, the airlock. So we call these airlocks. Um, the the law name is a dreamer. It just means sort of shrine or sanctuary or temple, or whatever. Um, but the, we we tend to call them airlocks because it just felt so natural. We just call it that all the time. And now, um, if you look at like the Steam discussions, everyone's just saying, "Oh, you need to get to the airlock." <laughs> That's that word is not written down. Yeah, anyway. it's really it's hilarious. But it's just like the perfect word for it. So this is like a safe space, basically, before you enter another level. So every time you complete an objective or a level, you always come back here, and you have the choice to either restock in the Zigastron, or you can take um, some health from the healing fountain. Sometimes there's weapon caches in here as well. So you can unlock a weapon and then you could choose, oh I want to go back through the portal. So the portal, that's the portal behind you there. That's it. Okay. This is so all you, the, that, the moment that of decision you. that we have. Yeah, Paris is like, do I carry on and risk losing my money or do I go back safe, bank my money and then sort of carry on? And I've actually made 150, and I am going to go buy something because I've got a bit more in my bank as well. So shall we go back? Oh, you want to, and then you want to go back? Try... Yeah, sure. We can go back. Yeah, go for one more. And then we'll try another objective. I think, like, it we'll sort of harkens back to what I was saying cycles. before about about um, sync points in the game as well, because every, every airlock is a is a sync point for the game. So, so what we're actually doing behind the scenes is once everyone reaches the airlock, we know where all the players are. We can safely sort of shut the airlock, unload the level that, that we just finished, and then we're actually loading the next level during that sort of loading screen that you that you might have seen as uh, the last person entered the airlock. So again, it's like the game's really big. We couldn't possibly load all of it into memory at once. So we need to uh, sort of find those kind of sync points to, yeah, to, uh, to, clear, to clear the memory yeah, exactly. and, and get one level loaded at a time. Otherwise, we're just going to overload everyone's computer. I, I see think, uh, I'm bought a health drink, which is one of, the most, one of the most important things. Yes. <laughs> Definitely, <laughs> yes. I know my weak point, and I know more health will help it, so... Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah health works in an interesting way. Just, yeah, I am not good at this game, you know, even though it's my own game. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm going full health. Yes. I think I'm going to pick up a... Uh, the 14 barreled shotgun, because how could I not? <laughs> well, of course. Of course. Obviously. It'd be rude not to. And uh, yeah, I'll grab my, my upgraded health ring as well. Awesome. Make sure we make it um, far. I have a question for y'all. Um, were there any big changes from the start of development to now? Obviously, I know you said that you had to go from Blueprint into C++, but also just gameplay-wise, did it always kind of look like this blend of um, melee and first-person shooter, or was it a little different in the initial kind of concept of it? I think probably I think it's it's like unrecognizable from the, <laughs> nearly unrecognizable, except for a few a few aspects. Like there's a particular weapon, the Sorokos, which is like a rifle that, that, that has really been in since I think the very beginning. I think it was the first weapon we had, wasn't it, Brett? It was always so we've always intended it to be an FPS, but we really it really took us a while to sort of figure out what is the format of the game, how like you know how do you move through the levels? We went from oh it's just an, a one arena shooter like a bit like Devil Daggers to oh it's a there's a big level one big level where you do lots of different objectives and then and then eventually we ended up here where because we're such a small team we have to decide what what is and isn't doable and make the smartest use of our resources. So we can't we can't just say, oh, we're going to make a huge game with a big open world, obviously. So yeah, that's sort of how it's all, it's all sort of happened organically based on that. Yeah. So as, as you can see here, like um, we try and reuse spaces, you know, more than you might in a, you know, a big triple A game like Destiny, where you have like these amazing sort of so many set pieces to go and explore and stuff like that. So we thought, you know, let's let's reuse spaces in a fun way. Let's let's have different objectives for every single level. 
um, minus a couple of special levels that have sort of their own secret things going on. Um, so yeah, we we try to be smart with the spaces we have. Um, we try to be smart with the enemies. So we have a stupid amount of enemies for an indie game, but again, we we have them reuse the same skeleton, um, which is like the animation. Um, it's basically how you animate um, these characters. We have a skeleton. Um, probably most people already know that, but you know some people might not. We have like a skeleton, and you can share this skeleton across different characters, even if it plays a different animation. So not only does it make the game cheaper, um, it makes it easier to create animations from the same skeleton. Um, so we have even we've even got these giant crab knights that share the same skeleton. <laughs> Um, uh, so they have a crab claw, and the crab claw is actually a thumb and a pinky finger. <laughs> um, but you, you don't notice that because you know you don't see the skeleton, so it's, it's just a hierarchical thing. Um, but it's just another cheap way of making Perish work on um, sort of mid-range PCs. And right. you have the added bonus of um, allowing us to use a lot of the characters as player skins as well, because we can just swap out the mesh, but have them play all the same animations. Or montages that the uh, that the players are playing. That's it. Yeah, and I'll another fun thing, you know, about yeah, another fun thing about old games is, um, you know, I'm just thinking of Time Splitters, uh, Time Splitters franchise, where you could sort of be loads of different characters in the game, no matter how wacky they were. Um, so we thought that that we we sort of try and do that ourselves, where if you find the codex entry for an enemy, you get to read about. The mythological lore behind that character uh, or that enemy because Parish is based on a lot of Greek and Roman or classical mythology with a bit of Christian sort of mythology in there as well. Um, mm -hmm. So we thought not only would it be fun to find the codex entry and actually you know learn about the world of Parish and the myths that inspired it, um, but we thought it'd be fun if you could sort of be the characters as well. If you want to be a giant crab running around, why the hell not? I do. Yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to highlight what's going to happen when I hit into the airlock. When I get into the airlock, so I'll be the last player in, and we'll, uh, you'll sort of notice as soon as I get in, the doors will slam shut. And what's going to happen is this level is going to unload, and then the next level will load in. And it's all using the level streaming system. So we have a, um, what we call it a global persistent level, but it's basically the uh, the base level where and all the other levels are, are loaded as instances within that. And it really yeah. helps to keep down the the load that the game has at any one point. It's a, it's a funny thing you don't really think about, but we had so much trouble um, just like figuring out the right distance for the doors without getting anyone like trapped on the other side. <laughs> just some really funny things like that you don't even think, think about. Yeah, especially when networking is involved because there's always a slight difference between what, what the host is experiencing and, what, and where the client is. And those tiny timing differences can make, can make a big difference when it's between, you know, you're sort of here where the box is or here. And that actually makes a difference because the client could be stuck into outside the door for the host who's inside the door and then suddenly you're soft locked. So it really gets, uh, gets complicated when there's more players involved. Yeah, so basically multiplayer is really hard. Just make a just make a single player game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's what do you mean? Multiplayer is so easy to set up. <laughs> it's the easiest <laughs> part of any game. Uh, for Parish it's, it's so absolutely been worth it. So worth it. Yeah. yeah. It it, it does it a, almost you know it, it wouldn't be the same game if it were just single player, okay. so it totally made sense, but yeah, it's definitely a challenge. Yeah. The uh, the level loading um, system in the Alux allows us to sort of have static lighting levels in each level as well, which gives Brett like uh, ultimate freedom really in having variation between levels. And again, it's really great for performance. So you can see we're in a completely different lighting scenario here compared to the last level. Yeah. It gave us a lot of, a lot more variation. Definitely. Can you tell me a little bit about this level too? Like any. Any thoughts that went into it? I mean, obviously, it's raining blood, which is a whole vibe <laughs> of course. in and of itself. <laughs> that was almost for the singular reason that I wanted the achievement um, rain and blood, just just for the old metal references for anyone <laughs> over the age of 30. Um. 
Even though I'm more of like a genty periphery listener, I was like, I, I have to have this reference. Um, and we just wanted to, we, uh, uh, I might have said um, earlier, but par when, you know, making Parish was a very natural, organic thing. So we started off with one level and then two levels. And then when we hit the third level and they were all black and gold, basically, we thought, we need to, I I'm not clever enough to make a game with two colors for the whole game. So I need to add some some color into this game. So we decided to shake up the levels and give each one a theme. Um, and I think that's for the betterment of the game itself. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's nice to shake up what the eyes are sort of experiencing. Um, the black and gold levels were really fun. Um, th those are whole levels that are gone now. Just they were really fun levels, but they're just gone. Um, so that's the funny thing about think, yeah, games. That's what happens. Just, in you can't be precious. Yeah, yeah you, can't, you can't be precious about levels and stuff that you've made if it just isn't quite right, so you just got to get rid of them. Yeah. So, so that's yeah. fun. I, yeah. I think not being precious is like one of our biggest advantages with, with, with us, it being just the two of us, because he's right, not only with this game, with you know removing a whole level that, that just didn't work or didn't fit, even though you love it, um, but you know, before we started Perish, we were actually making another game that was just so hilariously ambitious that we, you know, we we never could have made it with just the two of us. But we uh, so we basically cancelled it, and I think that's where we really learnt like, yeah, being precious doesn't doesn't actually necessarily help you. So so the difference yeah. with with Perish was that we started small. The idea was it was just going to be an arena with some weapons, uh, you know, again, almost like a Devil Daggers sort of game where you had some progression. And, it, and then it grew from that rather than starting with a, the biggest idea possible that you will probably never finish. And I think that gives you a much better chance of, uh, of actually getting somewhere. Yeah, th this level as well is kind of like where the game really starts to become the sort of difficult monster that it is. So this is the level where people might end up dying the most as well. So, so that circular temple that we were in before, that circular level um, called the Orphic Temple, um, that one's really just like the training ground, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and every when, when you've completed it the first couple of times, you just whiz through it in seconds. Um, so that's the fun thing about Parish. It's like you do a level, you get used to it, then you can whiz through it, and then before long, you're in the middle stages where it's all a bit crazier. Exactly. Especially once you have your gear, you, you really the, the power increases really fast. It really builds up. And uh, now that Tina's we've Tina's been uh, respawned because she uh, she died in that in that level, but because we made it back to the airlock, she gets to come back and uh, gets a selection of uh, extra powerful cards. So I saw you chose to refill all of your health. It's a good yes. choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we try and um, we try and encourage too? like. Oh yeah, <laughs> we try and. Uh... Oh look, we can see our scoreboard here as well. Um, yeah. Oh, no. Obviously, obviously, <laughs> Regan, the programmer, is doing amazingly. Um... I do have a fourteen-barrel shotgun. It's uh, it's an unfair. Yeah, that's true. So again, we're like back in an considering... airlock. And... Sorry, say that again. I feel like considering. I spent maybe the last third of that dead. I feel like I did okay. That's a pretty good number. Yeah, you did oh, very, yeah, you did very yeah. well. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, you've only got the axe as well, which just just as a um, point of reference is the second weapon that you unlock. Or, well, the first weapon you unlock in the game. You get given a broken sword at the beginning, so I think you're doing exactly pretty excellently. I've actually got a yeah. really powerful sword that's from a bit later on in the game, so mine's a bit unfair as well. So. <laughs> So, sorry so, all around. You, just, you stacked it against me, is what I'm hearing. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> so what do we think? Are we continuing? I think we can. Yeah. I think with your full health restore, we can do it. Yeah. I do want to... I, um, I, I want to talk about the broken sword that you mentioned as the starting weapon, because I feel like you say broken sword, and people have sort of a general idea of that in their head like maybe you know up the length of the blade half of it is cracked <laughs> or something but what when you say broken sword what do you actually mean because it's pretty intense 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, you're so true. Um, it is literally the hilt. Um, you don't really have any any sharp real estate whatsoever going on. Um, and uh, it's the best it's way of describing a blade I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> There's, yeah, there's really, there's really no sharpness going on. It's just a, a thrusting sort of hunk of twisted, broken metal, and it doesn't really do anything for you. Um, and it's, it's kind of part of the game progression as well, because um, there's a secret character in the hub world in Pantheon. Um, also, it's, <laughs> it's funny, but uh, this, this is a hard game, um, so we're <laughs> playing and talking at the same time is so tough. Um, <laughs> But I'm doing my absolute best. But yeah, so there's a there's a secret character in Pantheon, which is the hub world, and she asks you to find six fragments of this broken sword that you start with. So if you find them, you can reforge, or she can help you reforge this sword, and um, that's really useful because um, there's two endings to the game. Basically, there's a bad ending and a good ending, um, and I won't like super spoil it. But it's it basically the idea is. If you use money to, to get that weapon, um, you kind of get the bad ending. Um, so you need to use the broken sword. But there are ways of making the broken sword extremely powerful to get you to the end. And it's, it's still tough, it's still, you know, it's not easy to make it through the game with that sword. But yeah, there's two endings and everyone in your team needs to be on board for that ending in order to get it. So you all need to be wielding this um, broken sword. Uh, and it's part of like it's part of um, maybe taking a little bit from Dark Souls as well, where um, I have a I invested a lot of time in the lore and the way the characters talk to you, but you don't you don't have to you know engage with it if you don't want to. If you just want to kill demons, you, you don't care about the lore. That's that's totally cool with me because you know that's the that's the gameplay loop, just killing demons and trying to get to the end. But if you want to find all the codex entries and learn how to get the good ending and um, find over a, a hundred, you know, different codex entries, each of them, each of them written by me with a lot of research into um, ancient Greek, ancient Roman, and Christian mythology. Um, and another thing there, I did, I did do philosophy at university, so it did help a little bit with some of. Um, that stuff, but I'm still definitely an amateur compared to my historian friends who are actual ancient Greek academics and stuff now. Um, so, you know, it's it, it, Parish is still kind of my chimera of different mythologies rather than, you know, it's not a history, it's not a history game. As you can see, it's not a history game. There's guns. Um, what do you mean? <laughs> got my shotgun. But, but there is a lot of lore going on that you know, if you like that stuff, then it's there for you. But I don't want to shove it down your throat. Mm. Not very intense back there. Yeah, it, it did. That was an intense. intense. I died at literally the very end of it. Yeah, it was so <laughs> close. It was so close. It was so close. <laughs> That's fine. Though. It gives me a chance Some of your to... money, at least. Yeah, yeah. So I have my little, my petty reward for getting through part of it. Um, I did have a couple questions from chat that I wanted to throw at y'all to... Oh, yeah. Make it a little more difficult for you. Um, yeah, go for it. Outside of something like it literally raining blood, <laughs> do you have any other <laughs> overt references to bands or songs um, or anything like that through the game? Yeah, um, there's quite a few achievements like like that one that reference it. Um, uh, Tartarus is based on a an album cover. Uh, Tartarus is like a level in the game. I won't go into too much detail again, but it's based on a Thy Art is Murder album cover, um, or my interpretation thereof, uh, because I find that album cover just hilariously over the top. Um, it's very silly. It's very um, silly metal cover, and I, I love it. And uh, yeah, there's there's a whole level dedicated to that album cover, basically. So yeah, we have all kinds of silly little references here and there. That's awesome. Um, so why, I have to ask the question, I gotta throw it out there, but why did you end up choosing Unreal Engine over other game engines for this? Especially since it sounds like this was, this is a huge project for both of you. Is this your first fully released game or? 
Yeah, it's our it's our yeah, first it's... game that we've successfully released. <laughs> yeah, we've you I'm know like like every that other. You Unreal. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I, I I couldn't imagine honestly like authentically couldn't imagine doing doing it without Unreal Engine. It's just it's the tool for this kind of thing, um, because there's so much. I mean, Regan will, Regan could talk in broad terms about how you know on a technical level, Unreal helps make this possible with the multiplayer, you know, it's Unreal just has the framework there to help you get it in. Um, but just from just from making the art as well, you know, I could just I'm just used to the flow of it. I've been working in it since 2014. It's so easy to put anything in textures, um, uh, meshes, uh, uh, re, uh, you know, importing characters and animations. It's just so smooth. And sometimes, you know, you can make stuff directly in Unreal Engine if you need to like you know I've got you know like these temple pieces if I wanted to you know I could sometimes I need to sort of kit bash them together to form a larger mm -hmm. thing so I don't need to do that in you know Blender or 3ds Max or whatever I can do it straight in Unreal Engine and then I can you know um, make all my LODs which are level of detail models you know because if you look into the distance you don't want to render the full model you just want to render a, a, a cheaper approximation of that of that model right. Unreal Engine lets you you know, do all that as well. So obviously everyone's pretty familiar with that sort of stuff, but it's just simple things like that that just save you so much time that it's just all in the engine. It's so comprehensive. Yeah. I think it's allowed us to actually focus on making a game rather than rather than making tools to allow us to create a game, which I think is sort of what I didn't like about a lot of other solutions. Like, you know, I, I'm, I, I think even though as a programmer, patience is key. And uh, in lots of ways, I am patient. But <laughs> I've always been impatient with, say, like learning new tools or having to not having the tools that I want or need to, to just get on with the actual task of creating a game. Because we, we're not trying to create tools. We're not trying to create an engine, although I massively respect people that do. We really wanted to make a game. And, and Unreal Engine was not only what we knew already, um, from from doing a lot of sort of enterprise work, but also it's it had the least things in our way and gave us the most tools to actually complete something. I think to a ridiculous degree, especially when it comes to the art. Um, for for yeah. how few you know, just the two of us really, and just the one it's artist. Also just, just all the tutorial stuff ridiculous. over the years as well. Like yeah, like Chris Murphy, you know, with his amazing shader tutorials and and other other people as well. Like just the wealth of yeah content and information that's out there. Yeah. Boss fight time. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, it gets a bit rough from here on out. <laughs> I've already died twice. This is gonna be great. <laughs> oh, you've gotta be careful with the the running ones. They explode. Yeah. Uh, this was actually one of the first pieces we made as well. It is, yeah. To get her to come near one of the pillars, because it's a really interesting way we've done that, actually. We uh, have a quick look. We really wanted to make her feel epic. And you can see whenever she walks past these pillars, she'll destroy all of them. I think it adds yeah, like a really, really nice level of uh, Exactly. And uh, the interesting thing is, that's not simulated, that's actually a, a skeletal mesh that's been uh, animated in, in another program. And then we've we're bringing that in as a skill for mesh and playing that animation as you walk past, walk past it. So it's a really nice controlled way of getting some, some destruction in that you can trigger whenever you want really reliably. We found that really useful. It's used uh, all throughout the game actually. In case you're wondering what these like crazy blue shields and dropping are, um, I straight up took that idea from uh, Halo 3, I think it is, with the drop shields. It's, um, three, yeah. it's a nice okay. way to sort of push an enemies away. So you just like throw this thing down and then get inside it, and it's an absolute lifeline. 
when you need it in a crazy you game like this. definitely appreciated it. Although I just used my last one for demonstration purposes. <laughs> Let's hope I can refuel. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> That's fine. We don't need it. We're too pro. Secret door. Obviously. Secret oh. doors. Every game needs a secret everywhere. door. Yeah, Parish is very secrets based. Secrets heavy. I just hung back to appreciate the mirror with the portal in it. Oh yeah, I see you up there. I think we got a secret around here somewhere. Here we go, more Ooh. card selection. My card is the Dark Messiah. It's time to kick some enemies. Here we go. I think I'm going to bank all my money. Don't look at how much I've already got banked. <laughs> 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 bit. Awesome. So obviously there's, you know, we talked a little bit about some of the perks that you've found with working in Unreal, but as all of us know, development is not perfect or always easy. So I would also love to know um, about some challenges that you guys faced and maybe how you managed to get over that as well. Yeah, I think probably the biggest single challenge, although this one challenge brought about with it so many smaller ones, was, was obviously the game being multiplayer. Mm. Yeah, you, you can't imagine the... Well, I'm sure you can, but it's hard to imagine the, uh, the level of complexity that, that brings into all of the elements um, you don't think of. It's easy to think about um, some, some design decisions, like, oh, I want each of the players to spawn in one of these four coffin rooms like we have in in pantheon but but really it, it it permeates itself through the whole game it's why it's why uh you know there is no magic uh, make single player game multiplayer button because it it really is uh, <laughs> a thing you have to decide from the ground up or, and anyone who who takes on the challenges my respect to them because it's mad but i think one mm -hmm. thing that really helped um was actually when we switched to um epic online services um Although it comes with its own implementations, obviously, um, and challenges with that, but it allowed us because we really didn't want to. We knew the game was going to be sold on, you know, multiple stores, so we didn't want to have that like exclusive multiplayer. If you buy on Steam or if you buy on Epic, you can only play with your friends on Epic. Like that's just really annoying. Um, yeah. And that was the case with with the networking solution we had previously. So we switched to Epic Online Services, sort of use this uh, room code system, and uh, you know, you can log in with your Epic account. But it's all again, it's all optional allows you to to play with anyone who's got the game basically that's the that's the idea because i i think it's core to the whole experience that you can play it with people yeah we just wanted to make it as easy as possible as well didn't we so um you just don't have to do anything when you load up the game you don't have to log into anything you just open up join game type in a room code or just join random yeah, exactly. people on a public game and it really is that simple because the simpler it, yeah. it is for other people the simpler it is for us as well because you know, mm -hmm. most of the time, it's really hard to diagnose multiplayer problems when you're two people. Well, it's only one person that can really diagnose them because I'm an artist, <laughs> so it's just all up to <laughs> yeah. Read. yeah, that's true. Do you think we should continue awesome. or should we bank? It's up you to think? you. I did just unlock, I think, the first gun. Maybe. Yeah, let's go get the gun play a couple more objectives, we can get back here, yeah, no okay. problem. We'll fly through it. Yeah, Paris is all about sort of going back, taking stock, buying a stock barrel, <laughs> and then... Uh, <laughs> and then... Um, Making it further every time. Yeah. yeah. And there, there reaches the, the a point we, where... The boss we fought there... Go on, sorry. I think you were going to explain the same thing. Say, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was just going to say, like, there, there reaches a point of no return as well. So um, once you start making it to a certain um, series of levels, you just think to yourself, well, I could just do one more now. You know, I've got this big gun. I've, I've got this set of armor. I can, I can do it. Mm. So that's fun. Oh. I 
think because you because uh, you died in the uh, in the ruins, the red ruins with the raining blood, you missed out on the uh, the revolver that you can afford but haven't unlocked. Uh, but we'll we'll point you to it again. when we go when we go through again. <laughs> oh yeah, let's run back and grab that. Yeah, yeah more we'll reason. That. Yeah, so the boss that we just fought is uh, sort of the first minor boss. Um, amazingly, that's the minor boss. So with the uh, as you get to each major boss, you actually unlock a crown that lets you that lets you skip that sort of third of the game. Your next runs. So once you reach like a real milestone, you can uh, you can continue from that point onwards. It's very cool. Then it, it really does feel like you're you're making progress still. Exactly. Yeah. What this guy is huge and terrifying. He's a big guy. He's got a big spear. Okay. I've not got the right weapon for this. I believe in you, Brett. You can out spear him. <laughs> oh, it looks like I did it. Oh, we got another one. We've got another one. I'm sniping him from afar. Oh dear, I've lost the health. Look at him, he's just filled with spears. That's fine. Mm. Why not have a spear room? Speaking of uh, references, <laughs> I've already mentioned Devil Daggers a few times in one of my cards now. I've, I can choose the Devil Daggers card. It gives me uh, 100 rapid firing daggers, so I can uh, fully auto kill the enemies with my daggers. I tried to get a few references to the game that sort of inspired us in the cards. There's a little homage. Oh, that's another homage I have as well. I have a Pillars of Eternity achievement if you kill the Cthorau boss. Because A, I love that game, and B, there's pillars crumbling everywhere. <laughs> oh, that's true. I suppose yeah, that's yeah. the other nice thing about Unreal Engine, hasn't it? Going. Yeah, we did. I I did lose a life though in the first area, so. Oh no! Slightly <laughs> get, it, get it back in the in the airlock at least. Well, I'm curious about any, um, did you have any particularly fun or ridiculous bugs that hop, that popped up um, at some point in development or maybe QA found? And what exactly did that look like and how'd you deal with that? Hmm. I think one, one, cut, one bug that's, that we kind of kept because we thought it was funny was um, <laughs> we have this card called Medusa's Glare. And that card basically means if you look at things, you, you cause poison damage. But it also means if you look at pots uh, in the game, they also blow up. So you'll just have these randomly <laughs> exploding pots because you're medusering the heck out of them. Exactly. <laughs> There's one that's it's so minor that, and, it's, and it's just fun. We've already had a few people discover it and be like, I love this. So it's one we actually kept. <laughs> those, are the, those are the best bugs. Yeah, one turn uh, feature. Don't even bother you too much, exactly. Um, we have this other bug as well that's quite funny, where um, kind of in the, um, in the very last level, uh, there's a certain enemy that, that we keep telling it not to spawn in there, and it just decides that it wants to. <laughs> it it's like, it we can't it. keep it out. So it's just it happens to be the uh, that much the boss in that area. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. <laughs> Do it. I am going to need some help with this guy. He is I got him. eating spears. Nice. That's what a shotgun's all about. I switched to the uh, the Boreas bolt action rifle. Historically accurate, of course. Oh, oh yes, of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yes, the ancient Greek <laughs> sniper rifle. <laughs> <laughs> There's some liberties taken. Yes. Oh no, this is this is academically sound. Hint. 
Sarcasm. Yeah, a lot of the, probably the majority of, of, of bugs that we've we've encountered have come from from it being uh, multiplayer, especially with. Um, we, we really thought intros to bosses or, or moments in boss fights are really important. So we always have like you know a, a cool cutscene with an epic moment, and uh, actually sometimes getting those synced across across clients can be quite a challenge because you never know exactly what situation the clients are in. Um, one one really funny one we had is uh, is with one of the later bosses, um, and because of the way the levels are sort of laid out. We're actually moving further and further away from from origin, you know, from zero 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 in the game. Mm. And uh, one thing that a lot of people might not know when they first start getting into making a multiplayer game, as I didn't, and I learned the hard way, is that the further you get from origin at zero zero zero, the higher the numbers get of everything's position. The uh, sort of the the more ambiguous numbers become when they're sent over the network because there's all there's all kinds of things like that compressing those numbers to keep bandwidth down and lots of complicated things happening in the background so we had the the crab the, the huge crab boss at the uh at the one of the later bosses that sort of rises out of the ground as part of his intro for ho for the host looks great sand coming off the big crab body slowly rising out perfect but for the clients mm. sometimes It'll start in the ground, and then it'll wait maybe two seconds, and it'll shoot up into the sky, where his legs are still right there dangling down. <laughs> down. So you just have floating massive crab rising into the sky <laughs> until eventually the, host, the server is like, oh, that's not right. I need to correct that. And it'll boop, pop back down, and then the fight starts, and it's all fine. But that really, uh, that really is one that drove, drove me crazy, and it sort of turned out to be a network relevancy based on distance. So uh, yeah, there's so many options that, that you you don't necessarily know what they do or what they mean at first, and uh, you come to learn them over. I, I have to recommend if you do, if anyone does want to take on the challenge of making multiplayer games themselves, or even if you have a team, there's a a document called the, the I think it's called the Unreal Network Compendium. It's really, I'd recommend reading it before you start in full, because it really gives a good sort of basis for how how networking works in Unreal, I'd say it's vital, even. One thing that made me laugh about making um, like funny bugs is, again, talking about bosses, when we have these boss cutscenes, with these brief intros for the bosses. The first time we made it, um, the first time we made a cutscene for a boss, um, we had this... We, we, we basically forgot to turn off other players in the game. So you could, so you had this really epic cutscene, and then just me like trying to kick the boss from underneath while he's like trying to do a cool thing, and it just looked so. If I, it was so funny, I kind of wanted to keep it in. You can kind of see everyone derping about while this boss does this cool like, "Hey, I'm coming into the game, and I'm really cool." Right. Oh. And then everyone else is just there, sort of derping around. you from afar here. Yeah, look, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, in the thick of it right now. I can't even speak. <laughs> <laughs> I've got battle tongue. That's not a thing. I've just made that up. <laughs> oh. You know, if you pop over there, there's a weapon unlock. Oh, okay. See if I can manage that. Some fire support. Uh, one cool thing about weapons in the game as well is, um, you know, it's, it's a good thing about um, feedback as well. Getting feedback on the game because initially, so we have these weapons and then they have an active upgrade and a passive upgrade, and you used to just buy them all in the shop at once. But then um, uh, I can't remember who said it to us, but somebody said. Uh, why don't you just have like cool objectives that you have to complete in order to unlock these upgrades to your weapons? So um, what I have to do is 
Basically, I have, to, I have to kill 25 enemies while I'm in the air, while I'm hovering. So you just have these, like, funny objectives that you have to complete. And then you get <laughs> a much cooler sort of upgrade to your gun, rather than just, you know, just everything is money. So that's fun. That's very cool. Yeah, I think um, there's a couple of really good games that do it really well. I think Doom Eternal is perhaps an obvious one. Oh. Speaking God, of, it's, um, it's tough. <laughs> yeah, this is a tough objective. It gets tight. Oh, thank you. Yes. I think one yeah, thing that's one. um, oh, I've got a chain of them. One thing that's uh, was a challenge with Perish is a uh, sort of reacting to Somewhat. having the game difficulty react to how many players there are in the session, because obviously with the number of enemies that we have right now. It would be it would be absolutely impossible if you were solo. So mm. what we actually do is a uh, sort of a I call him the spawn director. It's a, it's an idea originally um, at least written down. I'm not sure how old the if the actual idea is from <laughs> from Left 4 Dead. Uh, and uh, it's basically um, an actor that's, that's always keeping track of sort of how many players there are. It tracks which objective is being um, is being performed, which level we're in. And then the level decides like which enemies it can spawn, and it's always reacting um, and choosing where to spawn enemies and how many and which type, all based on um, how many players there are and, and a number of other factors. And that's always changing dynamically. So, so if Tina dies, for example, me and Brett actually deal with slightly less enemies. It won't it won't spawn quite as many enemies because otherwise it, we would just get overwhelmed with the number of enemies for three players, for example. Yeah, that was so hard to get right, that balance there. Because if you take all yeah, the enemies, something that we're even still do. doing now, yeah. It's such a fine line between uh, feeling overwhelmed and, and, and being bored. So, yes. we yeah, we really have to scale it carefully. We do. We continue. What card, what card did you choose? Um, I picked the one that will block a single killing blow. <laughs> mm, that's a good one. That's a good one. That is, that is a fine choice. What do you reckon? Should we? We can take another guitar out. Uh, can I? I just want to open my check my volume settings. I think my music's turned off. I think my my volume has been reset. So if we could hide the room code so nobody crashes our party. <laughs> that's the problem with cross platform. Anyone can join. There we go. Oh, as soon as I open the menu, brilliant. We didn't get, we didn't hear the nice dulcet tones of the airlock music. Ah, uh, yeah. Very relaxing. Yeah, we, we exactly. Yeah. We often, we often turn down the music for like recording gameplay, so we can put the music over the top, and then we always forget to turn the music back on. <laughs> and we spend so much time making the soundtrack. <laughs> well, now they get to experience it, right? Yeah, it's going to get a little less exactly. relaxing in a moment. It's actually, it's really nice that the game is out now so that we can just sit back and play it a little bit. I mean, we're still, we're doing a lot of updates yeah. here and there, but here we go. We've done this before. We can take her on. We got this. We got this. There is obviously a huge variation in different creatures and enemy types. Uh, do you have a particular favorite creature or favorite boss? Yeah, I mine's a mine's a weird one. I really like these snake creatures that I made called the Ophidians. Not only because it's based on this really obscure book called Ophio Latria, which is just this weird. 19th century like cult serpent worship book. It just really made me laugh the book itself because it's it's quite silly when you read it, um, but it's also quite cool. And yeah, I just wanted to, I I sort of wanted to explore various mythologies that were a little bit less explored. So obviously, loads of people know loads of stuff about ancient Greek mythology, all the obvious stuff. But I wanted to explore some of the, the stranger ones. Um, so yeah, I went for I went for these tiny serpent guys, and uh, yeah, they make me laugh. I like the way they um, 
I like the way they ragdoll. Regan made a really nice um, sort of <laughs> ragdoll. Like, uh, every lot of time on that every physics character. asset. Yeah, every character needs a physics asset to sort of ragdoll nicely, and Regan just made the perfect one for that character. So maybe that's that's why it's my favourite. Don't you um, get the limits? And another one, just right. Yeah, yeah, you get like the the limits and the weights just perfect, and then it sort of ragdolls in the most satisfying way. Um, and another one is oh. I just I really like the priestess that the. Uh, that you see in the cutscenes and the story, because um, I just think she's cool and she's she's the character I fleshed out the most, and she's not she doesn't have your best interests at heart, so that's fun. Um, and again, like the story is simple, and we try and keep it simple so we don't like get in the way. But I had a lot of fun sort of crafting it and having and uh, sort of getting her moving and the way she reacts and interacts with you. Oh. You've been disconnected. Looks like I crashed. Oh no. So we'll go back to the uh we'll get back to the pantheon. So oh, we'll head back and we'll put on a crown, maybe, and we'll head Yeah, that's a good idea. Another. So that's another cool thing about the game. Um when you kill a boss, you get to sort of steal their crown. And when you steal their crown, it, it, you can sort of skip the levels that you just did to get to that boss. So um, mm -hmm. it's a nice little way of not playing the same levels over and over again. You can just get past them once you do the hardest bit. Right. I'm gonna restart because I think it's my computer being dumb. Nice. Yeah, go for it. I'll need to get out the room code in a second, so if we can hide that. Yeah. Oh, it definitely helps yeah, that we're just... um we're like in the same sort of country as well. Regan and I, obviously being brothers, we're in the same country, so uh, nice, nice smooth ping between us. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, that's actually one of the hardest things to sort of diagnose because sometimes you, you get players and they've got a friend in Asia and a friend in, in Europe and they're, and they're trying to play together and their ping is like 400. And, uh, you know, as a, we're a small team, so we didn't we don't have the bandwidth to sort of maintain dedicated servers. So, so uh, you know, one of the players is the host. And, uh, yeah, so it's really hard to sort of Make sure you to make the game robust enough to to handle that kind of situation, and and we actually made some improvements to that sort of you know later on in in development where I think we have some uh, leeway there because because the game's cooperative. There's not a competitive element to it, so we can sort of uh, rely on the client a little more for like things like movement and uh, right and stuff like that. There we go. No, I think you in. might have enough money for that sword. I think. Oh, really? So it might be new weapon is that, what was in that is, is that what was in that chest? The Eos. In the gorge, yeah. Exactly. Not gonna lie. If I'm I didn't notice because right. I just kicked it and ran, so <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. O often it's often the case. <laughs> do you have enough? I think you do. I think maybe because I disconnected, it didn't let me keep it. Sad face. Uh. But that's okay. I'm quite enjoying the axe, honestly. It gives me very dwarvish vibes, which I'm always down for. Yeah, it's, it's one of the last weapons. Well, it's one of the first weapons in the game, but one of the last that you uh, updated the model of, isn't it? Right. Yeah, it used to be this like hatchet model. Um, and that doesn't make sense for a weapon called Lebrius because... That means like double-edged blade or like double-edged axe. Um, so I had to make it double-edged just to make sense. And then I thought, while I'm at it, I'll make the axe way bigger as well. So yeah, now it has <laughs> this funny dwarven vibe to it. And yeah, yeah, uh, some of the weapons in the game, you know, obviously, really don't make sense lore-wise in the sort of mythology, ancient Greek strict mythology, but. Because uh, this weapon that I've got here, this I've gone back to the sword. Um, 
that's more like a flamenchvet, like a, a flame sword with a kind of funny sort of wiggly blade. And um, originally, originally it was a an Egyptian kopesh. Um, but I kind of wanted all these starter weapons um, to look a bit more cohesive with each other. So I kind of went for they this cool kind of gold and green, blue-green sort of thing. Absolutely. Yeah, because I've uh, beaten the first major boss already in this uh, in my save game, I, uh, I've equipped this crown of the first oval that allows us to skip past that that uh, section of the game and. Uh, we're going to get some new levels, some new art, and again, we're just going to see like the ridiculous amount of variation that Brett's uh, managed to cram in. Yeah, we tried to again, do that in a smart way as well. A one artist, somehow. So I tried to make these kind of tile sets that kind of um, just... Uh, like, you can reuse a lot, but they kind of... Um, they all have variation to them as well. Great objective to get. Let's have some fun in here. And destroy everything. Oh man. This is a satisfying level. <laughs> it's a real, I really like this one. Just run around, fight some Cyclops, destroy the shells. I did yeah. not pick the right weapon for this. <laughs> Again, even oh, even these right. larger characters, they're actually using the the same skeleton as as almost every other like humanoid enemy. There are only yeah, a couple of exceptions. I mean, they're so humanoid that um, they are actually a character skin as well. So you can run exactly. around as these yeah. hilarious. Must um... <laughs> <Awesome. laughs> grab the hammer. Go on, you grab the hammer. Find a little hammer. Grab the hammer. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. To keep up the, the variation by uh, having different enemies sort of coming in with each level that fit fit the level as well. So here we've got these golden maidens that you have to fight. Yeah, Kure, Chrissier, um always butchering the pronunciation, but basically they're the golden maidens of Hephaestus' palace. But um, in the original myth, you know, the, the Kure, like, uh, they bring him food and they clean and they tend to the world and I thought, well that's boring, I want them to be like warriors. So I turned them into warriors basically. Nice. Rule of cool. Speaking of uh, networking, um, this uh, these swinging axes actually turned out to be one of the biggest challenges in uh, getting synced across the network. Because you would think, oh I'll just send the, you know, the rotation of the axe uh, every tick to the to all the clients and it will be synced. But it turns out if you, uh, if you try to do that are actually just going to suck up everyone's internet connection and everyone else in their house as well so so you really they're actually uh there's actually again like a sinking moment when the uh when they first spawn in and a set um velocity but then rather than being physics based they're sort of um they're sort of being moved at the same rate on every client and then they're all synced at the very start so the host knows and the clients know that they must be in the same location without actually having to yeah. send those updates through the server because otherwise it's just it's a lot easier than you think to uh, saturate all the bandwidth that's available to you I actually want to change my favorite character I think it's going to be these two robot characters now so I always forget okay. like, how brutal their, their moveset is they just, they really might do say that. decimate. You might say that every level as we see them. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, this is my favorite character. No, this is Wait, my never favorite mind. character. This one, they're so, they're so yeah, fast. I mean, they're, they're all spinning. great. Might be here to, to defeat here. Ah! No. Oh. Oh dear. Oh, Brett's down. Oh no! 
Okay, yeah. you gotta use your sledgehammer. It's time. Isn't it? I'm gonna destroy the statues. Okay. Both of them? Both of them. Oh, yes. That's part of the game right there. Just smashing stuff. Destructibles. Oh, I've gotta go with David Agus. Oh, I like the achievement name for that one. Uh, Vendili. Yes. <laughs> All right, we can make it. I believe. We've got, we've got an escape route I didn't, now. I didn't, I didn't realize how much fun it was going to be to sort of come up with achievements and make achievements. That's one thing sort of you don't really think about when you're making a game. And then um, our friend, our friend um, Default Interactive helped us a lot with the achievements as well. So credit to him there as well. Um, so we've got, we've got like a silly amount of achievements, 63. Because I just couldn't, we just couldn't stop coming up with fun new ones. Yeah. I mean, it's, it didn't stop I some people like just hundred percenting it so fast. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, when it comes to achievements, you get to look at your game through a new perspective and think like, okay, well, what is something that you can do in this that feels worthy of rewarding the players for doing it? You know, which I think is. It's an interesting way to look at your project afterwards. Yeah, that's so true. Um, yeah, 100%. I think um, I didn't really appreciate that. You know, sometimes when I play games myself, I'm like, oh, achievements, I don't really care. And then I kind of got into them a lot more after making them. And now I'm playing other games and I'm like, ah, oh, I kind of really like getting achievements now. <laughs> I think um, this it's a bit of a tangent, but I think one thing that we that we sort of figured out figured out our workflow for when making Perish was um, was animations because we always I think a lot of people struggle with this, struggle with this especially um, hobbyists in UE4. Obviously, there's there's quite a few um, you know packs on the on the marketplace, um, mm -hmm. and although a lot of them are really high quality, like sometimes you still need some. Something specific for your game, you know. Uh, it could be how how your game's set up, or or anything really. Um, and I think missing an animator like is is a really common problem. I think that's why animation packs are so so common on the on the marketplace. But we actually found um, solution in that we don't have like a specific animator. And I'm, although it'd be great if we did, I'm sure we'd have even better animations. But our solution um, ended up actually being um, using a, a Rococo smart suit, which is like a cheaper motion capture solution, and mm -hmm. uh, and we'll clean that up in in some external software. But one thing that we've actually started looking into is bringing that uh, the recordings directly into Unreal, and then um, retargeting them and cleaning them up using the new control rig. It's not something we've like fully developed yet, but we're looking at it for you know future games. Hint, hint. Um, but it's actually <laughs> a really nice way to because it's always nice to cut out you know some of the admittedly far beyond hobbyist <laughs> uh, price of software, especially for something like mo like like mocap cleanup software. It's really specific. It's really expensive. Um, it's one. Of, it has been like one of our biggest like fixed costs, which you know is is not something that. That a lot of people, I think, talk about when it comes to making indie games. Like, once you really need to ship it, there's a lot. There's more costs than you think, you know. So I think the more that you can do in Unreal is the better, and the and the cheaper it will get for you, and the more sort of mm -hmm. attainable. Oh yeah, I wanted to get this objective. This is my favorite looking level, I think. It's so metal. It's very epic. I love the soundtrack for this one too. It feels yeah, this is very one of my epic. favorite songs. Yeah, it's definitely one of my favorite ones. It's nice to just, um, I know I said it before, but it's just nice to just play the game as well now that it's out. Um, especially it, it being, you know, a, a co-op game as well. Yeah, you get, get to enjoy of, um, you get, Yeah, you just get 
Especially since, you know, I, I'm just the art, so I'm kind of just... I'm still, you know, relatively fresh to some of the things that um, Regan has made in terms of the way it plays and feels. So I still get to experience it, like, as a game, if that makes sense. Whereas maybe Regan, <laughs> maybe less so, because he's playing what he's made. Whereas I, I'm running around what... I'm running around what I sort of see is mine, but the way it all feels is, I guess, all Regan. So it's kind of fun for me to still play it as well, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Hard not for me to uh, analyze as we play, always. <laughs> I think I'm going to die. Taking a lot of damage. Uh oh. We're really getting into some of the hardest areas in the game now. Yeah, this is a step up, this one. You're still using the axe, Tino. You're doing amazing. Who has the axe <laughs> yeah. at this point? And you're still. It made more it money. The levels. Made more money than me as well. I'm not. I'm not doing so good. In all fairness, um, I do feel like Regan is doing most of the work for me. So <laughs> I'm just I'm kind really of along for the ride. I think what harkens back again to like not being precious as well is uh, how much iteration some of these levels and, and enemies have gone through. I think especially this level, it when we first made it, it although we we could see the fun in it, it just wasn't. How do you describe it, Brett? There was something there was something off with it, wasn't there, when we first made this level, and it was a bit it was a bit too wide, it was a bit too open. Uh, you know, you get, you get too cavernous and you need some you need some constriction to it. Um, but you don't know that until you make it, so you need to make it first. Exactly, yeah. I think that's key to a lot of it. There's so much about the game that we wouldn't have known, we wouldn't have known to change until we actually, we just did it. Mm -hmm. It's been such a learning curve. You know, this is our first game. Um, such a learning curve. Oh, to, I died. Uh... Oh no! I lost so much money. <laughs> oh yeah, I could see. It's all down to you, uh -oh. bro. Yeah, making it from start to finish, getting to the finish line is absolutely the hardest bit. Uh oh, two health. Okay, you can do it. Can I do this? You got this. Spectating me. Believe. <laughs> I'm spectating you. Yeah. Am I going to the right arm? Yes, I am. That's one interesting thing I always find is uh, Brett was saying earlier about how you can you can just now it's released sort of play it as a game, um, and I don't really get that feeling when I play it because I've spent so many hours in the editor playing it. Even when, today, when I really, yeah. I'm just, I'm just yeah, even today, I'm just thinking about oh, what, how does you know what's going on? I can't not analyze it, but when I'm in the uh, spectator view. Suddenly, I always get this feeling like, oh my god, I made a game. It's a real game. It exists. It's out. <laughs> I don't know what it is about the spectator view that always gives me that feeling, but maybe yeah. it's because I'm not in control. <laughs> maybe, yeah. And, um, I'm just watching yeah, another player. Yeah, that's it. I think we also, we do make, you know, we make these games for other people to play. That's like the whole point, and it's amazing to just watch other people play it. It's really fun. Um, it's one of the most satisfying things. Oh, I'm in the lava! <laughs> um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, it's, it's one of the most satisfying things to watch other people play your game, but the main thing for me is still that it's, it's kind of like this is a game for me and my brother to play in a funny way, if that makes any sense at all. It's still that yeah. kind of... that kind of child... We're, we're just going back to our childhood a little bit and trying to make the game that we always wanted to play together. So yeah. that's kind of like, that's one of the most fun things about finally it being out, just being able to play it as well. Oh dear, I... I really walked into that one. <laughs> you got this, oh, one I health, Oop. I believe. <laughs> if I do it, I'm going to be so proud of myself. As soon as I, <laughs> you can do it. As soon as I get pressure, I, I lose it. I know we talked a little bit about this um, before the stream, but I did want to ask you about uh, what it's been like getting feedback now that it's been out for 
a week now, right? A little over mm. a week. Yeah. 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 I think I think exactly a week, isn't it? Oh no. Yeah. No, exactly. a little over a week. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. A week and a day. It yeah. Came out on Thursday, didn't it? Oh no. Yeah. I guess he's dead. Oh, he didn't make it. <laughs> All no. of us. Go <laughs> ding. Our journey to Elysium okay. failed. I said we'd die <laughs> at some point. Yeah. It's inevitable. We made a, we had a valiant yeah. effort. Yeah. Yeah, now I think with the, the feedback cool question. Coughing. Exactly, yeah. Um, I think like, throughout the development of the game, we were obviously, we, we had a demo at one point. We got loads of amazing feedback from that. And and I think the main, one of the biggest things is you never know what people are going to are gonna think or say. And, that, and you'll always get feedback on the bits that you don't expect to or, or you just don't consider. So when we first had the demo, like there was an overwhelming feedback of, I feel too slow. I need to move faster because I guess you know the the, uh, the game often gets compared to Doom, even though I think that's a generous comparison because um, they're such a small team. But yeah, so I guess people just expect it to move faster. So that's a, you know one of the, a nice, universal, easy thing to improve. Um, but I think the feedback like reinvigorated my passion for working on it again because you know the the sort of last let's say two months of working on your game before release uh, as a, at least as a programmer is is pretty it's tough because the game content was uh, done we we didn't we weren't adding new content and that's or adding new gameplay and that's obviously the bit you know i enjoy the most so um yeah so it gets it gets tough at the at the last hurdle you know because you're just bug fixing you're just fixing bugs all you ever hear is this isn't working <laughs> and then when you and then when people play the game they're like oh i i really like it like i think we should you should you should try this or you should consider like making this change and i'm like yeah like most of the time I'm like yeah they're they're right that is a good change i just never thought about that so i think feedback like opens your opens your mind to uh so much and, oh, and yeah, it sort of like definitely. reinvigorated my love of working on it actually so I've, I think I've as soon, yeah. As soon as you give it to people, they they play it in ways you never thought they anyone would play it, because when you're all working on it, you all start to play it in the same way, um, exactly. and other people yeah. start playing it in a completely different way because they're just fresh to it. They're, they have a you know like a tabula rasa, like a blank slate of of what to what to expect and what the experience is going to be like and um and then they share that feedback in the forums in the steam forums and uh um on our discord and all stuff like that and uh already we've released you know some patches like addressing some of that and it's just it's kind of fun it's just fun it's fun to hear people's ideas and then it's fun when we put that idea in the game and then they're like wow thanks so much for like actually listening to us and putting it in the game and like it's this fun feedback loop between us and the people who are playing the game. And I wasn't expecting that as much. I just wasn't expecting that to be a quite a fun thing, you know, interacting with everyone and talking about Parrish and talking about what's fun about it and what could be better. And then yeah. actually putting that in the game and then everyone's like, oh, that's cool, well done, thanks for putting it in. And that, that gives you this fun sense of sort of satisfaction as well. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I think even even people who are you know say you know something's happened in the game and they're annoyed about it you know it's a frustrating game <laughs> nothing wrong with that uh, no doubt about it but, it's, but as soon as you as soon as you engage with them um, and you say yeah that's a good idea maybe we should you know make that change and, and maybe we do and it's in a patch and uh, you know pretty quickly people are like oh I feel like involved and you know everyone really appreciates it I think. And it's a multiplayer game as well, so it has to be, you know, the commu it is the community. It's not a single player game, you know, it's, it's about playing it together and sort of, you know, working with other people to make sure everyone's having fun. Can I? Yeah. So that's been. Yeah. Can I interrupt you for just a moment to ask about mm -hmm. this yeah. card? Oh, yeah. Craft and Flora <laughs> periodically deposit puddles beneath you in which enemies may fatally slip. <laughs> 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 Those are uh, puddles of libations, um, also called wine. Basically wine. <laughs> You're going to be tripping up all the enemies that are going to be slipping on your on your dropped wine. Amazing. I am. Oh, that's a funny bug. That just reminded me of a bug, actually. Um, oh yeah, that's true. 
Um, <laughs> when we first made that card, even the hardest bosses in the game would just slip up on one puddle of one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We'd have like a 10 meter tall boss and then they'd just slip on your small puddle of wine <laughs> and immediately die. Uh, oh my god. This is some of the kind of things you don't think of. We're gonna make it we're gonna make it to the uh, the major boss of this this quarter of the game this time. Alright, we've got this. Yeah, we've got it. Looks like you're leaking everywhere. Oh, man. Yeah, I, I do remember you mentioning that uh, it was very player dependent too, where you had some people who were saying that the game was way too hard because your QA yeah. testers were were getting accustomed to the difficulty level. They were like, oh, I think this could be harder. I think it could be harder now. And then on release, it was a bit of a monster for some. Exactly, yeah. And, but, and we really want to cater to, to all of those people, people who find it too hard and to people who find it too, too difficult. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are both the same thing. Too hard and too easy. <laughs> 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 um, You don't want anyone to feel sort of left out by the difficulty, and we're not really, you know, we're not really interested in like excluding people based on that. We really, just want people to see comparisons about the moments, like when you first see the the Cathoral boss and she pulls up the dog skull from the from the floor and spawns, you know, exploding yeah, enemies. Just... That, that's where the fun is for, for, for me to perish. Although the challenge it's is about is great, that, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. But kind of balance that, um, like everyone can get involved with. This is not a walk in the park. You want to find that sort of middle ground. Yeah, and having the challenges there for people who really want it. Yeah, having having different difficulties helps, but you also need to make sure those difficulties kind of align with like expectation. And there's also a bit of um, something I didn't really expect. But um, we noticed when people started playing, it didn't matter how familiar you were with FPS games. Almost everyone would click punishing as a difficulty, just because it sounded cool. So even yeah. the words, you, even the words you pick, um, kind of influence what people are going to click on and how they're going to play the game. So you know, maybe we should have like explained the difficulties a bit more at the beginning as well. So that's a, that was a fun learning experience as well you know UI is so important and that includes the words that are sort of wrapped in the UI as well I've gone for Medusa's glare so I'm gonna look at some pots when we get into the next airlock quite the party we're building here <laughs> yeah, we're really, uh, we're really getting powered up. And... Oh, yeah. <laughs> you should unlock the, you should unlock the pistol. The oh yeah. Oh. It's over here. Uh, yes. You actually, uh, yeah. So you actually have to kick these, uh, these chests to unlock weapons. Originally, you had to go up to them and press E. Then we realised we have a kick. So why not kick the lid off? I think it's uh, one of the most satisfying parts in the game. When you get the chance to, to pay attention to it. Yeah. It feels great. The kick in general, yeah, I feel like you did a really good job of just making oh. it feel very powerful. Yeah. Like this is this isn't a tiny pushback, this is a full attack. It feels Thank very you. powerful. Yeah. So much time spent on that kick and no, a single frame in the animation makes such a big difference to how it feels. I think that's one thing that's really hard to to get across is, you know, what do people call it? People call it like game feel, don't they? But it's uh, game juice. such a hard thing to finesse and, and it's a nebulous thing to chase. But when you when you get there, you just know, you just feel it. Yeah, look, I'm exploding, exploding pots with my mind. <laughs> One, um, one funny thing about the kick is that the sound is um, we recorded a kick drum 
from a from a drum kit and then blended it with a 808 sample and then just absolutely sort of EQ'd it until it was absolute monster of a kick. So, so even, uh, even the kick, even the kick, even is, the musical. kick is musical. From the um, and we went through quite a few iterations of the kick animation as well, because the first time it wasn't quite obvious what was going on, um, and that's that's another benefit of having like a producer and a publisher, because um, we had this we had we had this amazing um, we had two amazing producers now, um, Joseph and Reinhardt, and um, Joseph said, you know, this kick needs to be more like Dark Messiah. It needs to ha it needs to be more in the frame. It needs to kick right in the center of the screen. Let's get the kick right. And we were like, yeah, that's so true. The kick just the kick needs to be for perfect. If you have a kick, it needs to be perfect. So I, I think Regan really nailed the animation for that. So it's really fun to use for me personally. I think it's probably like the most universally loved part of the game. It's kicking. <laughs> it's so good. Yeah. Free free DLC update. Kickathon. <laughs> kick everything. Do a kick run, no damage. Oh. No damage kick run. I should mention about the soundtrack as well actually. A lot of the um we although we had a we, we got our, our our publisher in uh twenty twenty one, I think, right? Right? Um they uh, allowed us to work on it full time. So before that we were working part time sort of between freelance work, which is a really tough <laughs> really tough thing to do to make a game part time. That's so tough. It's really uh, draining. And uh, along with that, um, at one point we we also actually received a uh, an Unreal Mega Grant to help us with development as well. And I think actually with the soundtrack, a lot of that uh, some of that money went to help fund uh, getting it sort of turned into a full album and you know, multiple songs for every every level. I think there's like almost an hour and a half of music or something, isn't there, Brett? Like it's a ridiculous amount. It's a huge album. Yeah. Like so twenty eight songs or something insane. Full, so full props to Jack for making it yeah. such a good really? Drop Shield. Can I do it? Yeah, very nice. We're cruising now, absolutely cruising. Cruising through it. We all got a good card. I got a good card. I'm really, really pulling a dagger Ten build seconds. here. Full on dagger run. Yeah, dagger builds <laughs> can be really powerful. Underrated build. We watched some guy on YouTube. When uh, when the demo was out a few months ago, um, we watched a guy on YouTube um, do a dagger only build, and he just slayed the first two major bosses. Um, absolutely slayed them in about three seconds. That was fun, just, <laughs> fun to watch. <laughs> yeah, he just melted them. Do you first see really fun any? Yeah, do you Sorry. foresee any um, issues with maybe balancing in the future, or do you feel pretty comfortable with how the game is balanced right now? Hmm. I think there's still some balancing to be done. Definitely now it's out in the wild. Um, we've hmm. done a little bit as well. Like the shotgun needed to be boosted a little bit. We nerfed it a bit too much just before release. Um, yeah, and it's all about how other players sort of react. Like. We think something feels really good, but if other people think, no, this isn't right, then I think we'll go ahead and look at it anyway, because it, it needs to feel good to everyone. I think feedback everyone, like is so vital for that. Yeah, exactly. The feedback from, from real players playing it for the first time. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. So if there's feedback, you know, just, just keep it coming. <laughs> that's, that's what I'd say. Just, just keep, keep throwing it our way, because it's just so helpful. Because um, this game is for, you know, not it's not for us in the end, even though we made it for each other to play a single play, to make the sort of single player game of our dreams. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, feedback is so good. I think we can cruise through this again. 
Oh, they're waking up. We're gonna destroy it. We're all looking powerful enough. Oh, maybe I'll throw a little drop shield down. Yeah. You can't even get to us in here. If she can. comes, like get another one. She can, yes. Oh. Oh. No problem. Such a bad aim. I always get my lightning upgrade on the spear, and then when it comes to hitting something useful with it, I end up throwing it at the wall. <laughs> I was hoping for an epic denouement where I just like throw the lightning spear and it destroys the boss, but I just like it just sort of Maybe next time. hit the wall. Maybe next time, <laughs> next boss. <laughs> Are there any particular um, features, and this could be combat or just general run of the game, um, but is, are there any particular features or tools that you're particularly proud of? Hmm. I think actually um, the way the weapon system works was really important. Like the base classes need to be really robust but, but the main thing is uh, we wanted a huge amount of like weapon variety so i think actually adding a new weapon sounds like a huge amount of work and and it's probably more work for brett on the art side than it is for me to, to add on the uh on the game side because we have such a robust system for it so I think really like the number of weapons and the speed with which we can can implement new ones was really important. I think I don't I don't even know how many we have in total. Do you know do you know Brett off the top of your head? Ooh, it's got to be approaching weapons. twenty, and they all have you know passive and active upgrades, and uh, you know that we try to make them all like really unique. And you're just spilling wine everywhere. <laughs> 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 I thought I'd redecorate a little, you know, and exactly. maybe some color. But, yeah, but I think really color, like yeah. that's just the that's just the best example of of how I've tried to create every system to be easily extensible. Because if if you make things in an absolute way where they're not compartmentalized, then you can it can make adding new content or changing it really difficult. And I think the key to to actually finishing something is iteration, and if it takes a long time to iterate, you'll you know you'll never you'll never manage it. We don't have the manpower to sort of brute force, uh, you know, lo lots of changes. So we have to be smart with the sort of what we choose to focus on. So the more you can make your like your basic gameplay systems like extendable and and, and flexible, it leaves you more agile. And I think us being agile is probably our biggest like strength in making games and take us a we don't, really we don't have a long decision making process we can no. we can just sort of get get on with making those changes and we know and we know what to change quickly oh my i am um, oh, getting battered over here i really like the card system i just think it's fun to click on cards i like the fire effect that we made uh, it's just simple and I know, I know it's simple as well, I just find it satisfying to click on a card. I think I that like makes that satisfying cards. sounds as well. Yeah, I like the fact that the cards sort of look different. Um, I know it's a really simple sort of system, but it just works for me. I just find it quite fun every time you use. It just changes the way you play the game a little bit each time you have a new card. Yeah, it really lends to kind of roguelike feel. Yeah, definitely. It's funny because it's like it is. It is kind of a, a co-op story campaign, you know, where you sort of um, you make your way through 
these levels and the priestess, she sort of narrates the world to you as you go along and the story elements get more and more like the further you get in to the game. Um, especially with some of the ending sort of cutscenes and stuff. Try and make it a little bit more poignant rather than silly. Um, but it's nice to have these roguelike elements along the way where the objectives change in every level each time you play and uh, you have this card system and you have these weapon caches that you can unlock weapons at and yeah I just like the whole thing it's like it's just the kind of game that itches my or tickles my itch rather got to place these logs down at the uh, the bottom of the snake and get it burning you've got the last one Oh, this I think it's one. Really, um, yeah, I was, yeah always, it. I was looking at the smaller one. I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah, so if you press it, there we go. Where's <laughs> the torch? Okay. I'm just going to make it stay in this level forever. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to. We're in the labyrinth, so. so although, <laughs> although me and Brett don't anymore, most people are getting lost pretty quickly. Yeah. I suppose that's the funny thing about... Um, level design as well, you immediately have the, the, the layout of the level burnt into your memory, so you have no trouble navigating it, but you give it to someone new and they're like, you know, I don't know where I'm going, right? <laughs> that was me. I was just following you two. I figured, y'all know what you're doing. I'll just, I'll just tag <laughs> along. One thing that's been um, really fun for me is um, I didn't realize how much people would be into 100%ing the codex entries. So like finding all the secrets in the world and some of them are really sneakily hidden. Like I've been a bit cheeky. Yeah. Um, so it's been nice to just see people sort of conversing in the forums and stuff and trying to find all the secrets. Is there a hint for one that you could give here? Any potential players? The, the nastiest one to find is at the earliest point in the game. <laughs> That's cryptic enough. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> the meanest hiding Very spot. Big. Very big, I love it. My jump was not off cooldown, so don't mind me. I, did, I definitely didn't just fall into the spike pit. It's fine. We don't need to talk I about it. I 100% just did the same thing. <laughs> nobody saw me, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but I got to admit to it, if I'm not the only one. I appreciate it. it makes me feel better. <laughs> one, one piece of feedback we've actually implemented since the release is uh, you'll notice in, in most objectives, when you sort of take the first step, um, you get a message on the screen and a sort of war horn that says the enemy threat increases and then another when uh, when there's less enemies that says the enemy threat lessens. What we found was um, there was actually already the system in the game, the spawn director that I described earlier, that sort of increases the number of enemies that can spawn and how quickly they spawn in um, when you start an objective, when you sort of take that first step. Because we wanted some quieter period at the start to give you a chance to explore the levels and and find secrets and that kind of thing. Um, but people didn't even realize it was there because they, their experience was they go into a level and, wow, there's already enemies I'm fighting. So they wouldn't notice that the enemies speed up um, or they wouldn't tie that uh, into, you know, they would just think it's a coincidence at the start of the objective. So um, one of the so adding that sort of signposting and that, that notification that tells you there's enemies coming, prepare, already makes, you know, people who found the, the game too difficult, they find it easier even without any real changes it's just a change to their sort of perception right i think that that kind of change is really interesting because it's almost becomes a kind of um you call that like well, psychological you know, exactly that yeah exactly that's it yeah definitely it also makes me think of um the shadow of mordor again um that the the sort of um when did that come out? Maybe 2014? Um, Thing like that. What I really liked in that game was um, this sense of you know when the danger's coming because you get this big horn and all the orcs start coming and you're like, okay, and now it's going down. Exactly. Yeah. That kind of telegraphing. That telegraphing could be quite satisfying. So yeah, we, 
that was an idea that someone else had, so we, we implemented that um, last week. Ready to Just roll in? Whenever we're in for here. Let's see what. <laughs> oh. Gnarly. Yeah, we really wanted to get crazy with the bosses. These are the moments that you're, that you're struggling for. This is what the struggle's all about. Oh no, Press, <laughs> press died. Uh, my internet briefly went out and back again. Oh no. It's just you and me. One of the things about living in the UK is, uh, well, on the south coast of the UK, is uh, not so good internet. Yeah, I think Perish is all about sort of moments that we, that we, I think it's how we crafted a lot of it. We thought, we thought of what, what's the moment that we want and uh, we'll see one, we'll see one of those moments quite soon because I really think that's, that's what elevates Perish and my favourite thing about it, especially when the music's involved. Yeah. There is one thing in this arena that I remember you showing me before about, uh, can't you harass the onlookers? Of our fight, and yes, all these, all these, this crowd—they're actually characters. I can kill them, and when uh, massively underrated feature, that not many people notice is when I take damage. The crowd uh, gets up and cheers. <laughs> yeah, if we, if we had time, which we didn't, we would have loved to have done more, more with that. Because having a crowd that kind of like reacts is really funny. Yeah, it's so fun. Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, best bit. Oh, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, it's still one of my favorite parts of the whole game. It's so, so epic. It just, it changes the whole, the whole ambience and everything. It's incredible. Exactly. And we really tried to, you know, we spent so much time getting that synced with the, with the music as well. That timing is so specific. So glad we got it. The only, the only reason, reason there's two bosses in this level is because of those um, moons around Mars called Deimos and Phobos. And I just thought, well, if I'm going to have one enemy called Deimos, which kind of means horror, and you've got to have Phobos as well. That, that, that's just an example of, you know, like, reading around and just kind of coming up with bosses and ideas for games just out of things that are completely irrelevant, like two, two moons around Mars. <laughs> and then yeah. we just had this idea, oh, two bosses! That's the kind of thinking that's dangerous when you're, <laughs> when you're a small team, but you, you manage to pull it off somehow. Are they all praying now at the back? Yeah. Everyone get praying. Pray for the two survivors. <laughs> Maybe the it's worth talking about how, how we achieve this, you know, this sort of level transition. Because, again, it's still all static lighting, isn't it? Yes. We just um, we changed the process and we changed the colour of the skybox. Just like quite simple things, again. Simple, simple always works. I think more than overcomplicating things. And then obviously you made the particle effects, which exactly, yeah, um, which helps I think convey exactly, yeah. The moon. There's so many, so many small elements that by themselves are really simple to create that that effect when he when he blows up the moon, the moon itself that that shatters. You can see the pieces still floating there in space. That's uh, again like a. Um, it's actually a skeletal mesh. Each of those pieces is a bone, and, and Brett simulated that explosion, so it's the same every single time. We're just playing an animation. That's all, and that just works by itself. Separately, we're changing values in the post process that you know changes the sort of color and, and ambience of the level, um, and then we're changing the color of like the fog and the other skybox elements, and then we have this. Um, if you look up in the sky, there's this Niagara particle where we have uh, these uh, mesh particles that then have a, a following trail 
show the uh, you know the pieces of the moon flying down and uh, actually during the fight we have um, sort of similar projectiles that come down and can damage and kill you or the boss as has happened to us once I think where a meteor came down hit the hit the boss in his glass jar <laughs> and killed him <laughs> I was, was going to mention the, the, funny, most, um... it, the most insane timing that I don't think will ever happen again yeah, we uh, we finished this level and the boss is about a year and a half ago for this level. Um, but one thing that really made me, one one thing that made me laugh about this um, level was the meteors that come down when the moon explodes. They're they're kind of there to damage you as well, so you kind of have to get out of the way. But yeah. we realised if you kill the boss and then you stand in place, there's a tiny chance that you get hit, and that happened to us once. And uh, dying to a meteor after you've killed two bosses. Is not fun. Yeah. <laughs> so we, exactly, we fixed that pretty quick shot. We fall back to just the particles and not the actual projectiles once yeah. that happens. <laughs> but you know, to the player, that these these particles that are coming now and the ones that actually land in the arena, like they look the same. They don't know what the difference is, and that's the important thing. So it's all it's all sort of smoke and mirrors. Right, and you're just culling illusion. culling the audience, aren't you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> They're all slipping on your wine. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I thought I'd, I'd be nice and offer a drink to everyone in the audience, and they're just they they're not having it. it for some reason. Yeah, that's another funny technical thing. I think it shows it really obviously when they slip on your wine, but um, they're, <laughs> they're like because there's so many enemies, um, you know, we have to be very careful with with how many like skeletal meshes we have on on screen. So we actually change the the tick the tick rate of all these enemies um, as they get further away. So if I if I go up close to one right here, you can see the animation is nice and smooth. He's obviously got a lower LOD value as well, as you can see. Mm. But then as I move away from him, if you really pay attention, you can see that the animation isn't updating as frequently. And that's what allowed us to have to fill out the, you know, the this, this crowd as much as we as much as we could, because we really yeah, didn't want it to feel dead. Me. They're obviously yeah. quite dead now, but it was really important to us that you could kill them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm just helping, you know, that's all. Yeah, I'm just chilling. Just I'm not doing anything. Hand, yeah. yeah, I'm, you know, I'm going through the stands. Does anybody want a drink? <laughs> want a snack? No? Yeah. <laughs> just trying to be nice. That's a great little optimization tip, though, of having it. <laughs> I've never seen this done before. It. This is very funny to me. I want to try this. Yeah, now. making the slip on the wine is so good. Yeah. Yeah, it's really helpful, and and it, and it is actually on every character in the game. It's obviously just the most aggressive on the crowd enemies, mm -hmm. um, but even for the regular enemies, it helps. And similarly with multiplayer, like reducing their network, it's um, um, so like send rate update rate uh, based on their distance is actually something that Unreal Engine already does, which is one of those really nice things that you don't you don't really have to worry about too much. Um, the only time you have to worry about it um, is when it's doing it's it's being you know, too helpful and uh, making your making your your things that need to be absolutely one hundred percent reliable. It will it might you know cull their sort of network um, mm. to save bandwidth. So you have to so you end up doing the opposite. But that's a lot nicer than having to manually set up uh, you know distance based update sending. It's just yeah. another one of those things that Unreal does for you. Well, I have one final question for both of y'all because we're about at time here. But yeah, and what a way! That's a great boss. It's a great view too. to end on. Yeah, yeah. This is um, where you would unlock the uh, the crown that lets you skip as well. Yeah. My last question for both of you is: if you had, um, if you have one tip to give other developers based off of what you've learned through the whole process of making this game, what would that be? Hmm, that's a good one. Um, it, yeah, that's the, the funny thing about that is I still have like a little bit of imposter syndrome, if that makes sense, because it's like we're like an indie team and it's our first game. But I guess now that we've done it all the way to the end, I would just say try to make what you want to make rather than what people sort of would expect you to make because we made some changes to the game early on to try and fit what 
we would expect other people would want. And I think the game is better now that we made what we wanted to make. That might seem a bit like vague and silly and cryptic, but yeah, I, I think maybe that's good advice. Just like yeah, it's all about the fun, right? If games are about fun, whether you're making them or whether you're playing them. So just make the thing that you really that you think is missing. Yeah, I think for me, it's um, it's about being patient with yourself when you're working on it, especially when you're a small team, because you're you're gonna have plenty of times where you're sick of working on it and it's really annoying you and uh and and sort of accepting that that actually is normal in in a project like it will go up and down and your feelings about it will change over time um but in the end you'll be happy that you sort of push through those those harder moments because it's not always although making games is amazing fun on balance it's not always fun 100 percent of the time because you know you get bugs and they're really annoying and uh you gotta make <laughs> people rebind their rebind their keys oh that stuff is the that's just the, that's the worst <laughs> it's so complicated yeah um but but all of that stuff is worth it if you're making something that you that you care about so yeah i think that's the most important part to just sort of as long as you believe in the game itself to just sort of keep going, even when you're not necessarily enjoying working on it that much, as long as you do again, that's, that's the important part. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first, thank you both so much for coming on the show today and playing this incredible game that you have built together with me. This was so much fun. The game itself is just so, it feels so good. You know, I feel like there, there are some games where, you play it, but it's a bit of a slog at times, and it's still good, but this feels fun to play all the way through. There was never a part where I thought it, you know, it felt slow or unbalanced or anything. You've really done a great job of building an experience. And for all of you who are well, watching, you. I really hope that you take the time to go buy, download, and actually play this game because watching it, it is beautiful and it is action-packed and it is fun, but playing it is a whole other experience. And I, I really recommend that you you take the time and, and give it a shot because it is so much fun. And there's still, I, I'm sure there's so many aspects of the game that we didn't even get to touch upon in today's stream. So go check it out. It's It's so good. I promise you're gonna love it. Thank you so much. Yeah, Thank thanks you for everyone having us, and just thanks for playing it with us. It's really we're like honoured because we're just massive Unreal fanboys. <laughs> so thanks so much. <laughs> of thanks course, it was on. such a pleasure to have you on. Where can everyone find you if they're interested in downloading the game or reaching out to you and, and learning more? Yeah, so the game's on um, Steam. It's on GOG and it's on the Epic Store as well. Just search Perish on on any of those. And uh, you can buy the soundtrack as well. Uh, and uh, you can find us on at item underscore 42 on Twitter. It's probably where we're most sort of active. There's a giveaway happening at the moment, actually, where you can win. Right, you should show it. You can win a little figurine of oh, the yeah. Cthulhu boss and, the, and some yeah, keycaps. Like, cool. I can't bring it up too high because my keyboard's like plugged in. Oh, no. You, <laughs> you, can just, you can just barely see the, yeah, show them the Cthulhu escape key. Thing. Look at that. Look at that demon, escape key. The demon. That's the best. It's, just, it's the stupidest <laughs> escape key you've ever seen. Look at that. It's, so so it's enormous. So Every time I press escape in a game, I'm like, slam. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you can, you, can get, you can get one of those. It's, it's quite fun. I yeah. like it. And a key for the game as well. If you, yeah, on, so, you can find the, uh, the giveaway on our Twitter at item underscore 42. Yeah. And on our personal ones, Brett Game Dev, Regan Game Dev, we just talk about Unreal stuff sometimes and just... Yeah, but it's it's mostly parish, but um, yeah, just come and join and talk. It's all good fun. It's, m it's mostly parish for now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having oh, a holiday nice. first. <laughs> yeah, 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 we need a holiday <laughs> first. <laughs> yeah, <I'm tired. laughs> yeah, absolutely. You've earned it. So please do yeah. <laughs> take a little bit of a break. Um, but yeah, again, just thank you both so much for taking the time to speak with us and our community today. And thank you everyone for watching and 
being part of the stream, the show wouldn't be what it is without you and your interaction genuinely and truly. So thank you all so much for taking the time to hang out with us as we played the game. And hopefully you'll, you'll give it a go. You'll give it a gander and I know you'll love it. So please give it a shot. Um, if you missed any part of the stream today, no worries whatsoever. We post all of our streams in video format available on both our Twitch and YouTube channels at Unreal Engine. You can also follow us on all social media at Unreal Engine to get some news and some updates and all that good stuff, as well as please come say hi in the forums. Join us there. You can get all of the news and updates that you could ever possibly imagine, as well as tutorials and help and a community where you can ask questions if you're interested in getting involved in the Unreal community and starting up your own development journey as well as you can also find the announcement post for today's stream, which will have all of the links <laughs> you could ever possibly need associated on there as well. So thank you all so much for coming and thank you for watching. And I will see all the rest of y'all next week for the next Inside Unreal show. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, bye.